Welcome to our recording, which is taking place on the occasions of Border, the fifth edition of the Spanish Latin American Festival. For this very session, we are very, very welcome to meet with Christine, Christine Dwyer Hickey. Good morning. Good morning. So you're here to talk in to talk at a festival which is going <coughs> to be about border, and indeed our world has never been so aware of borders, mm -hmm. their fluctuations, their ontological power, the impact it has on our sense of identity, be it national, social, personal. But there is another element of the border, which is the artistic border and the fictional border that maybe you are more akin to, uh, because in a way literature serves as a threshold to debate to transcend or to articulate our own fears, fantasies or feelings which we have towards reality. And fiction and reality is very much at the heart of your, of your writing. Uh, Christine, on the Irish scene, is one of the prominent literary figures, having published short stories, or play, uh, novels as well. And uh, Christine also divides, a border is also at the heart of her life in the sense that Christine divides her time between Dublin and Italy. So border for you, where do we go with that? Well, <coughs> I suppose I'm, I'm very lucky in the time and place that I inhabit, that I don't have to worry too much about physical borders or geographical borders or political borders. And there's a great sense of freedom in being an Irish writer now. And uh, actually, I've just come back from the States yesterday and I I, start, I was in a town called Provincetown, which is what they call gay friendly. And it occurred to me while I was there how dated it appeared because we are so, um, not tolerant is even too strong a word, but we're, we're, we're just so, it's so normal to be gay in Ireland now that these people had to come to this particular town on the very, very tip of Cape Cod to be gay in peace and maybe think about how progressive Ireland is and how we have great freedom in expression in all sorts of ways. But anyway, I'm digressing. As a writer, I think, and I always, I, I can only speak as a writer, um, there are borders. Uh, and that's why fiction works, because each character has to have a certain amount of borders around them. and be confined in a certain way to it's almost it's almost like physics if they're confined within one space then all this energy starts to 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 frizzle and to, you know conflicts mm. and all that kind of thing and then we have something to write about mm. so in that sense yes i will be aware of borders there was an interesting work on uh, infra urban borders in one of your books which took place in suburbia yeah and mm. um can you talk to us about the role of women in suburbia in your novel. And that one, yeah, and that novel, it's um, it's about, I suppose we'd use it like, the, I think, is it, is it, it the confines, like, is it French, la, la confine is, is yeah. the French word, isn't it? Um, and these women are, were put, it's, it's set in the, both present time and in the 70s, when it was very normal for, um, most women would, would, would stay at home and mind the children and they would be in the suburbs and the men would disappear during the day. And so these women were confined and they were almost like grown up children in charge of the younger children. And so they'd no life outside that. And that's what I dealt with, what I looked at, that, that sort of social confinement, um, which was ruled by, instead of having sort of a, a regime or a dictator ruling them, respectability would have been their dictator. Mm. And that gave for that was my just my general idea of it. And then I let things looked at all these people confined in this one particular space. And then I let them sort of let's see what happens now. Mm. You know. When you're starting a novel, uh, do you gener do you create to yourself specific borders? Do you create your own space from the very practical? Yeah, the first thing I need, I almost look at it as making a film. So the first thing I need is my location. And then I will pick one character to start with and get inside the head of that one character. And I never see, it's like I put the camera in their head and the camera looks through and the sound in their ears. And my characters never see, uh, are they, it's, it's whatever they see in here and nothing else comes into the novel from their particular point of view. So I, I get my characters, my casting, all that sort of thing. And I get to know the characters very well, put the character down into my location and you have to have your clock as well to know what time it's going to take place. 
and then I'll just see what happens. Mm. I'll have a vague idea and I'll see what happens. Mm. My new novel I'm working on now is set in 1950 in um, Cape Cod. Okay. So I have my location and I have my year and I have my three characters. I have known them a bit and now I have to see it, make them do something mm. to earn mm. a space on the page. Do they, do they surprise you sometimes? Oh, yes. It can't be too aware. I'm not, I'm a writer who tries to pull myself away from the work. And sometimes when I read back, I sort of think, how did that happen? But mm. it, it's happened. Mm. I let it, let the work, it's, I think that's the artistic side of it, that mm. you have to let the work mm. take over mm. and stop thinking about yourself. To remember the author is the least important uh, factor yeah. about make, in the making of a novel or, or a short story. Mm. Mm. From a, from a foreigner's perspective and from a foreigner's readership perspective, uh, you have been translated into many different languages, yeah. including Arabic, Lithuanian yeah. as well. You were Estonian. Estonian. Estonian, sorry. Yeah, that's coming out now. So, uh, I'll start again. You have Arabic. been translated in Arabic, you have yeah. been translated in Estonian, into many other languages. Yeah. And these books of yours go into another type of border, the border on, yes. on the other side of the border of translation. Yeah. Uh, what are your feelings towards your translation? Do you meet with the translator? Do you? Well, I'm, I, I've, there's an Italian translator at the moment translating The Cold Eye of Heaven, which is very much a Dublin book yeah. and a Dublin man yes. uh, over a period of 75 years. And she will ask, she's, she's fluent in English, flawless in English, and she's very, very good understanding of Dublin A's because there is there's English mm. and there's Irish England, uh, English and there's Dublin English mm. and she she's a very very good understanding but she would still ask me certain things that you're trying to explain um, th that just can't be translated and I was reading recently Dubliners in French and I noticed how many things they didn't quite get mm. Mm. Um, it could be small things like Barnbrack they would call a brioche but it's not yeah. that's not the point of it or when they would um, describe someone as being a femme du commune, excuse my French translation, they said a woman of the commune, but it's, a, it's someone who's a bit common, Joyce yeah. wanted, and that means something completely mm. different. So there are those little things. Mm. Now, when it comes to Arabic, how am I to know? They could be saying anything. Mm. They could be mm. telling me anything. <laughs> but we have the um, Ireland, Ireland Literature Exchange Straight. and a, a translation here, and they check that out, and they have the translator has to send in a sample first. Mm, mm, so, mm. Um, I, we, we, well, you know, you, I trust in them and that's the way yeah. it's going to be. But there's yeah. always going to be small, small and large things, nuances mm. that are skipped. And mm. even in the English language, yeah. um, when the Cold Dive Heaven, I have an English, my English publisher wrote to me and said, um, are pubs in Ireland also chemist shops, pharmacies? And I said, no, why? And she said, well, you have them going in for a cure. Okay, you know, yes. which was a cure for mm. hangover, but they didn't they didn't get that, you know, mm. so I had to explain mm. that and that's the, a common mm. language. And you're, you're, you're alluding to the fact that uh, you're alluding to the Irishness of your text and mm. you are quintessentially an Irish writer. It, it feels Irish to some extent. What? Well, I've, I've written, I mean, I've, my Italian novel, Last Train from Liguria, is not mm. and you know mm. she's she was born in Ireland but she lives in England and she goes to Italy yeah. so I had to become Italian for that mm. so it's a question of, again if I can draw on the film thing you have to become an actress for each different character and pretend that you're that person do you, do you drop your Irishness to become Italian for the train of Liguria? did you drop your Irishness well yes you do you have to kind of empty gut yourself empty everything out and then become try to pretend and what I do and it's whether this is whether I'm writing about an old man or a young child or I, I've particularly done it since Tatty which would have been my yeah. fourth novel about a little girl growing up mm. that I literally made myself the size of a five-year-old then a six-year-old and a seven-year-old as you go up mm. and looked at the world through those eyes and you know I still do that I still write that way mm. you mm. know so Irishness you can't what does that mean I, I don't know really what it means mm. because the Dublin, a Dublin writer is different to a, a, to a rural writer. And we see more rural Irish writers now, I think, than Dublin writers. Mm -hmm. Small town Ireland, you know? As, to, as a writer, uh, are you very much receptive to what is happening at the moment in the world of politics? Uh, Funny, I'm more interested in American po politics at the moment because... Which <laughs> provides a lot of fiction, states. anyway. But, <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, no, I used to be, you know, when I was um, 
poor and barefoot and pregnant. I took great interest in politics because I, I couldn't afford to do anything else. But now I'm not so much. I mean, if I'm writing something that is, for example, I wasn't going to write a, the, an Italian novel and set it in 1930s and not deal with fascism. Yeah. You had to do that. But I don't deliberately try to make a point politically. We're always aware of it. So I'd be more of a social writer. I would be more aware of coming down here, for example, the amount of young people that I'd see sleeping in doorways and lost and lost forever. Mm. That kind of thing would have more of an effect to me than listening to Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael slagging each other off and, and on television, you know. I hear you. Yeah, I hear do you know what I mean? When do you know that uh, that a, f a book is finished? Or do you is a book ever finished? Well, some books you think, step away from the book, ma'am. Just step away from it now. And you have to because you feel you could stay with it forever. But you just instinctively know that you're now coming to the end of the book. Mm. And and then people then say, oh, I wanted more. I want to find out more. And I like to finish it when there's possibilities. Mm. Mm. You know, when there's still possibilities. And you well, just know by instinct. And everyone <laughs> is different. Everyone is different. Well, unfortunately, we have to close now. But uh, first of all, I want to thank you very much. And also, I want to tell you that we're really looking forward to your book to come. Okay, thank okay. you. Thank, thank you. you very okay, much. Okay, thank you.